welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. I'm Anthony Scott, Pastoral Associate for Congregational Care at First Plymouth Congregational Church in the Metro Denver Association of the United Church of Christ. It is my charge to welcome each of you into this space. God's words to Moses were to remove his shoes because the ground upon which he stood was holy. I, I don't know what the virtual equivalent of removing one's shoes might be, but please know that this ground, this, this space, the subject matter around which we gather is holy. I invite you to make yourselves ready to enter this space by entering covenant together. We are people of, the, of covenant. We are Christians, people of the United Church of Christ followers in the way of Jesus. Covenant for the sake of our time together entails a promise, a contract even of sorts, where we outline the ways in which we will comport ourselves and participate in this space. In preparation for our gathering today, we created terms of covenant, which will provide guidance for our time together today. The first uh, element of this covenant is the Vegas rule. I hope you're all familiar with the Vegas rule. The Vegas rule is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in this group remains in this group. We value confidentiality. We also want to make space for thoughtful engagement. Please allow room for silence. Silence in this space in which we gather and silence in your own mind. Uh, if anyone speaks, let it be from their own experience. And we are here to withhold judgment. I want to end with a, a final uh, word about covenant. Uh, together we will hold the spirit of Ubuntu. It is a South African word which can be translated, I am because you are. We are a community of fellow travelers. We're in this together. Respect and reverent acknowledgement to one another. Also, to help us understand the, the heart or the meaning of what is spoken in this sacred space, allow me to define a few terms. Just a few terms. First, racist. A racist is an individual who participates in and or benefits from systemic racism. Well then, what is racism? Racism is prejudice plus power. Racism is different from racial, racial prejudice or hatred or discrimination. Racism involves having the power to carry out systemic discriminatory practices through the major institutions of our society. Next, we'll define white privilege. White privilege is an advantage, a good or a resource that people with ascribed white racial identities receive and or have greater access to, and that people with ascribed non-white racial identities are denied or have less access to, primarily as a consequence of their ascribed racial identity. Next, white supremacy. White supremacy is the systemic provision of social, political, economic, and psychological benefit and or advantage to persons who identify as white alongside the systemic provision of burdens and disadvantages to people who are not white or white supremacy may be a set of norms and expectations predicated on white habits or the preferences, taste, emotions, and perceptions of white Americans. Third, white supremacy is the belief that white people are inherently superior to people of color and should dominate over people of color. Microaggression. Microaggression is a small, subtle, pernicious act of racism. It is also brief remarks, vague insults, casual dismissals, 
and nonverbal exchanges that serve to slight a person due to their race. Finally, white fragility. White fragility is a state in which an even uh, in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger or fear or guilt and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving stress-inducing situations. These behaviors in turn function to reinstate white racial equilibrium. As this is sacred space, please hear these words of scripture from John's uh, Apocalypse, from John's Revelation, the seventh chapter, verse nine. It is written, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. I bring this scripture before you this, this afternoon because John's world, the world in which John found himself, uh, was a world of chaos, was a world of discord, a world that he no longer recognized and and was exiled, found himself on the isle called Patmos and in the spirit and with sanctified imagination, put forth this vision, this, this vision which, which included tr people from multiple tribes and languages and people groups. The world in which we live is also chaotic has thrown a lot of us off kilter as we have seen and acknowledged uh, the effects of racism, uh, systemic racism, white privilege in, in our midst. And so together, let us, let us strive to live into even the vision of beloved community crafted uh, by John of Patmos, that we would all be worshiping together that we would all be one, one in our diversity. I invite you now to take a breath. Inhale, I invite you to exhale. Let us be together in prayer. Oh God, you hovered over the chaotic waters of creation, bringing forth clarity, bringing forth order, bringing understanding. We gathered in this virtual gathering, ask you to be with us hovering over us by the power of the Spirit to guide our thoughts, our words, and our understandings as we reason together about the impact of racism in our congregations, our communities, our conference, and the world in which we live. Guide, gracious God. Be now with us. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who is Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. Corbin, are you jumping in here? Or am I? Got it. Okay. Just making sure. Didn't want to cut you off. Uh, I am just uh, so pleased by the number of people who are gathering with us uh, this afternoon. Um, and I just want a thumbs up. Can you hear me? I've had microphone problems today. You're all hearing me okay. Okay, good. Uh, 
Sue and I called together uh, the group that is leading this time together, this racial justice think tank, following the murder of George Floyd, to ask the question, what is the role of conference in dismantling racism in ourselves, in our churches, in our communities, and in our world? And we have known that calling together such a group uh, is, is past far overdue. And, uh, and I think that became even more in relief for me this week, as some of you may be aware and some of you may, be, may not be aware, but we want to bring this to our attention because this is happening right here. This is here in our midst. This is part of our conference. Uh, a colleague of ours was forced to resign from her church this weekend, Reverend Tracy Perry, um, pastor of Faith United Church of Christ. And um, as in the case with any humans in any system, this is a complex story with multiple stories, many that led to the events of this past week. I don't need to go into all the details of what, that's, what those multiple stories are, uh, but I do need to name one, and that is racism. Um, the overt and complicit racism that Tracy endured is undeniable and soul-wrenching. And for me personally, both as her friend and as a colleague, I would love to be able to say that it was only certain members of that church. But in my own wrestling with the Holy Spirit over the last few days, as I have asked, please Spirit, show me what I need to see. I too can see my own complicity in my work, long work, arduous work, committed work with this church. I too can see where I I have failed and where my own bias, where my own blindness, um, my own white fragility kept me from speaking, kept me from the capacity to speak. And, um, and I don't know that it would have changed the outcome of where we stand today, but I know that it might have changed my friend's experience going through it. And we are here today because it's right here. And I also, in my prayers with the Holy Spirit over the last couple of days, have also asked the question, where has our institution failed in this moment? And, um, and I think part of it, as I've reflected, is that I could become an associate conference minister um, without the training necessary. Um, without having been called to account prior to me getting this position, to have greater capacity to stand where I needed to stand. This is not in any way to say I'm, I'm, you know, this is just me wanting to admit it's not over there, it's not somewhere else, it isn't all of us. It is here in the Rocky Mountain Conference, it is in me. And I pride myself on being part of the work and yet I still have blind spots. I still have places where I can see that I have failed. And uh, and as painful it is for me to admit that, it's more painful for me to see the church harming colleagues and friends and people of color. And so as people who are called to love, ultimately that is our mission, that is our goal, to love. And that is why we are here, that is why we are calling this, this team together, why we are committing to this work, because we know the church is capable of better. That is our mission, that is Jesus' call to us. And I um, am grateful that so many have come to participate and we are excited to bring what we have begun to work on, how we can begin to unpack and dismantle what is present. Um, and and I, um, I think that's all I need to say for right now. <laughs> um, but I want to pass it on to Corbin because I also want to say, you know, that this isn't just one instance. Uh, this is just an example an egregious example, but it's not the only example of where we have seen both overt and complicit racism in our, in our um, conference. So Corbin, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Actually, maybe I need to hand it. No, I'll hand it to you and then you hand it to Sue. <laughs> Get to witness our, our, our on the fly here. Thank you for sharing that story and Anthony, thank you for that uh, witness and that grounding. Um, 
For those that don't know me, I'm Corbin Toby Davis, uh, Executive Director of the Rock Center, which um, was and is a continuing project of ministry of Parkview Congregational Church in Aurora. And um, yeah, I, I come to this virtual table with a mixture of trepidation, of anger, of sadness, of confusion. And for me, it, it's rooted as uh, a child who grew up in the United Church of Christ, who loved being able to tell that story and recognizing I was always raised that, you know, we were the church on the right side of history, right? We, we did things the right way. We made the right choices, that those issues that we needed to fix were always out there. I was raised in a home that we were taught the value of colorblindness, that we don't see color. We treat everyone equal because we are God's people. And I think this was also what I was taught both implicitly and explicitly in church. And it wasn't until I was outside the walls of church that I began to encounter the depth of what racism really looked like, that it wasn't just people in white hooded robes, burning crosses, using terrible language, but it was in these systems that were established in this country that were established on top of black and brown bodies. From the genocide of Native Americans, the enslavement of Africans, to the use and abuse of immigrant labor that continues, it's in our very foundations and it's in our interest as those of us that identify as white folk to ignore, to look away but I believe in a Jesus that calls us to those spaces of discomfort. I believe in the power of new life comes only after we've dealt with the pain of crucifixion, the pain of naming the sins that live not out there, but within us. And in preparing for this, Reverend Dr. Scott and I were in conversation and I was sharing stories with him about walking with members in discernment of African descent and while there were only two or three at this time, they would both confide being confused one for the other. I remember another conversation with a person of African descent walking the, the line between where they would seek their ordination and very clearly stating to me that they knew that this was not a safe place for them. And I also have to own that I didn't understand, but I tried to explain away, no, you must have misheard or you don't really understand, right? I was layering my experience on top of them. And this is part of the work that we are all called to. We're not called to heal that which is out there. We have to begin with that which is within us. Those lenses of dominance that come to us from a system of oppression and death. We have been gifted by prophets for generations that have called us to lean into liberation and life. And for those of us that are saying yes to this moment, we have to know that the journey towards liberation in life is not one that will come easy and comfortably. As Aaron, Reverend Gilmore bared witness to today, we have seen the fruits of this oppressive system right before our eyes. And we see how it harms us collectively, but most importantly, this harm is lynched upon black and brown bodies. We must face this. If we are to be the great vision of the kingdom of God, this is the work that we have to face. And I'm also angry and sad that it took the murder of George Floyd to bring us to this point because this has emerged and existed long before that. So we have some witness to bear, some accounting to do. And it is here in our midst, in our churches, in our implicit biases that we carry. And friends, this is work that we're not going to heal alone, but we are invited to take a step on the journey that we may pave a better path for the generations to come. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being uncomfortable. Another part of our journey is that we tend to push away that discomfort. And so I'm gonna invite us just to take a moment before I pass to another colleague here 
to check in with your body. And if you can close your eyes, you can do that. But I want you to be aware of where are you feeling, where are you sensing this conversation in your body? So let's be still for a moment and just notice what our body is communicating with us. Friends, the work of healing is before us. The call from John, from our ancestors of faith, is here and now. Let us examine the wound. Let us recognize it in its fullness. And let us seek with spirit guiding to do that work for which we are called as Christians as followers of the way of Jesus. Thank you for being here. And I pass the virtual mic to Claire, I believe. Or Sue, sorry, Sue is gonna step in. We keep trying to cut off the great Reverend Sue Art. <laughs> Boy, I love that. I love putting being put up on a, a platform. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've gotta, I gotta share with you that last fall, uh, the conference ministers of the United Church of Christ gathered in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, and uh, spent a lot of time in Birmingham and in Montgomery. I remember the morning we were in Montgomery, uh, standing at the very place that the slave auction blocks were most, uh, most um, active in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, right there in that middle of that street. And there is a racial justice institute that has been built in one of the slave houses that where they would have housed the slaves before they were put on that auction block. And that racial justice institute is, is worth going down there for, for all of us. Um, it painted a picture. It was a beautiful museum that had been done with exquisite detail, but it painted a picture that I think that most white Americans don't get. I'm going to share it really quickly that it painted a picture since the 1600s of an uninterrupted, unbroken trail of capitalism built on the, on the black, backs of blacks and brown people in America. An uninterrupted trail of black and brown bodies being part of the capitalist system in America that has built the wealth that, Amer that white Americans have today. Those of you who watched Susan Thistlethwaite's uh, wonderful keynote for us saw the chart that even in the past 50 years, the shift in white income has more than redoubled and black income has barely moved at all. So this is an issue. It is an issue we're going to deal with. Yes, it is. Um, shameful that we are only at this point now on the heels of George Floyd's death, but we are here now. And let me tell you my commitment as leader of the conference is to build a sustainable movement. And that sustainability is only going to be fostered by us listening to the generals of justice in our presence. And those generals of justice are our friends of black and brown skin. They are the generals of justice who will lead us into a new way of thinking and being again, over and against this paradigm that we've lived in thinking that all that we have is deservedly ours. This is going to be difficult conversation, but our, my commitment for the rest of the time that I am here in Rocky Mountain is to continue to keep this on a front burner priority. 
this group that's been called together so far, the racial justice think tank is just that, it's a think tank that as the board of directors will look at this work that they are building for us, they're building a platform right now to say, these are the ways that everyone in the conference can engage in one way or another, and they're gonna show that to you. The board of directors will view that work. We will commission a team. Many of the people on the racial justice think tank will move on to that team and many other positions will be made available so that you too can be a part. But friends, there is no other moment than now for us to undertake this work. And my commitment to you is as long as I'm in this seat, it will be a priority ministry of the United Church of Christ. So thank you for being on the front and leading edge of this with the conference. We are going to rely on you as we move forward in this moment. And you need to direct me who I need to pass the virtual microphone to. <laughs> is that Claire? Oh, yep. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Right. Um, this is a sidebar. Donna Bristow, can you please mail this link, email this link to Cayenne right now? He just asked me and I can't do it. Thank you. So um, here's, what, here's what typically happens in um, gatherings. And... Uh, what happens is we, we gather, and I've been watching various and sundry people um, taking notes as fast as you possibly can, because what typically happens is folks come to these so that they can get as much information as they can to have these conversations with their congregations in such a way that one, won't piss them off, two, will solve the problem, and three, will make us feel like good white people because we did our due diligence. And that's not what we're about here. If anything, what, what has happened in the past couple of days with our, with our dear friend and colleague Tracy is that we have been overcome with emotion. And um, as such, this has become even more urgent in our own family than perhaps we realized it was a week ago. Because the tendency is that we believe that we are here as pastors and lady of the United Church of Christ to get as much information as we can to come in and save, assist, and fix and that's just not how it works. We come wanting information, thinking that we are the ones who will make it better without acknowledging ever that we're the ones that are the problem. And so I can't help but notice, and I'm sure you have all heard this analogy uh, before, but I'm going to expand on it a little bit because I, I don't think it's coincidental that we are having this conversation about the racial pandemic in the midst of COVID. It, it's too profoundly connected to think that the universe hasn't in some way, shape or form thrown this and put it right up in front of our faces so that we can no longer avoid the conversations. The, the mantra, I can't breathe is the same mantra for both for crying out loud, right? The same notion that um, some of us are walking around uh, walking infections and have refused to wear masks and are putting others at risk is a perfect connection. The idea that we can be carrying something that is not seen, but yet has profound and deadly effects on others is a perfect connection. The idea that some of us will wear masks and other, uh, others of us think that we are above that because there's no way we are responsible for passing it on or we are not on the receiving end and what will never happen to us is a perfect connection. Every person in the world, this is a global issue, both of them. This is a global pandemic, both of them. Every person in the world is at risk for in some way, shape, or form contracting or passing COVID-19. Every person in the world is in some way, shape, or form capable and does pass on racism or on the receiving end of it. 
Our liberation as people of European descent is intimately woven with the liberation of every person who is on the receiving end of racism. There is no if, ands, or buts about it. We are not less susceptible. In fact, in some ways, we are more susceptible. As if we needed another example, in the church that uh, ousted um, Tracy, it is interesting to note that three people in that church who were attempting to have her get out suffered heart attacks and physical and mental ailments at the same time. People of European descent. We are all affected by the insidiousness of the virus, the pandemic that is racism. So today is not about taking notes and figuring out how to do this in your church. Today is about recognizing that as Aaron so beautifully and humbly offered, it is about recognizing that each and every one of us is complicit in this pandemic. That not participating in any kind of deconstruction of our own understanding and complicity is the equivalent of not wearing a mask. It is the equivalent of saying, to go on as life as usual. The parallels to these two pandemics are extraordinary. So tonight is about making the decision as to whether to go about business as usual and tossing aside your mask and continuing to perpetuate racism that we all as people of European descent perpetuate or to take upon ourselves that mantle of protecting our sisters and brothers by recognizing our own complicity and doing what we need to do, wearing that mask of dismantling our own racism, so as to avoid passing on this contagion every single day, a contagion that brings death every single day to our siblings. Erin? Thanks, Claire. Yes, um, Pedro, I don't know if you want to speak now, um, but just uh, our think tank is all sharing a bit of their, uh, we've been in conversation for, I think almost two months, about six weeks together. Um, so I would invite um, Pedro, if you want to, Kay, I know you also have um, a bit to share, so yeah. One of the things that has been arising in my consciousness, and I brought this up to uh, the think tank as we discussed how to navigate this space and to be witnesses to uh, the, the challenges that we see in our nation being reflected in our own space and our own um, very liberal um, as a national level uh, denomination was the restoration that Jesus offered to Peter and Peter denied Jesus three times. And in that story, uh, Peter was intimately uh, connected to Christ. He, in fact, was one of the people that said, hey, I know exactly who you are. Um, I'm that close to you. But then in the time of Jesus's abandonment, uh, Peter forgot everything that he knew, forgot everything that he studied, um, forgot all the lessons, all the things that were a part of their uh, relationship and he looked out for himself. And that's a tendency that resides in each and every one of us. And the temptation will come up for many of us uh, to be able to save our own skins, if you will, um, whether it's directly or whether it's metaphorically or whether it's just as we witness our own thoughts and our own uh, things that arise as we confront what's been uh, in our nation for since its inception. And yet, um, as people who uh, are walking with Christ, we know that Christ, 
as we have studied these teachings, uh, he knew that Peter was going to do this. In fact, he told Peter in advance, this is what you're going to do. And we have a tendency as individuals to say, you know, if someone does this to me, then I'm going to do it to them, the very opposite of what Jesus taught. Um, and we tend to make excuses for when we fail and we don't want to live, live into it or own up to it. And we also have a hard time receiving the grace to return, uh, to be witnesses of our own failings and to confront that and then to be restored into relationship. And it's my personal belief that if we can't hold that um, as a faith organization or faith community, then we are doomed to fail. And I think that it's important for us to witness that, that there, we are going to fail many, many times in this um, effort. Uh, but if we make room, if we have grace and we trust the grace that's sufficient um, in our failings and in our weaknesses, then we can be restored. And once we are restored, we can hold that invitational presence um, for others who, as they encounter uh, this witness, may say, hey, I didn't realize what I didn't know, but I do now. How can I be restored? And there has to be a place for them to come back to. And so it's important to me in this work, not just with, primarily for myself, it's because of my relationship with Christ that I'm working on. And I imagine that it may be the same for, I hope it's the same for all of you, but I'll just say that I imagine it's the same for many of you. Um, that even in our grief, even in our anger, even in our upset, um, that we will still know that there's room. Because if there isn't room, then, then, there's, then there's no point to doing any of this. Um, so I hope that we can be mindful of that and, and own up to our failings, own up to our mistakes and then keep moving forward. Not, that, I just want to speak for grace in that, in that moment, but not the grace to not do anything, but to, the grace to keep doing the work. And I'll be quiet at that point. <laughs> Thanks, Pedro. <clears throat> and Kay, I know on the, that uh, there's a space for you to, that you wanted to share as well, so I want to acknowledge that. Thank you, Pedro. This work is important. And it's important to me because racism and white supremacy are alive and well. And they are destroying people's lives and the community, the beloved community. Somehow many of us missed the truth that I am because you are. And somewhere along the line, we seem to have forgotten that we are one body, each a part of the bigger whole. And that when one of us hurts, we all hurt. I have heard many people say that these protests, and I have said that these protests remind me of the 60s, full of idealistic ideas, but nothing changed. Many have been fighting racism and homophobia for years. They are tired. They are tired of fighting and they are tired of feeling guilty. I too remember those protests. I too have been accused of being an idealist. I too am tired. We are all tired and our brothers and sisters of color must be exhausted. However, my guilt, my beating myself up, my denial, 
my good intentions and my tiredness are not doing anyone any good, including myself. I must own my complicity. I must own my failures. I must educate myself and resolve to do things differently. People all around me are hurting and I am hurting. We cannot let this time pass without making changes. Chris, I think you wanted to say something. I'm not sure where we are on our list. <laughs> um, I can. Uh, I'm Chris Gilmore. I'm the minister at Sixth Avenue United Church of Christ in, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, so it's my belief that if it's not already, uh, this has to be a central piece of our ministry. I don't really know how you, how you can follow Jesus and not be deeply engaged in anti-racism work, at least authentically. And for those of us who are white uh, lay leaders and ministers, that, that means thinking seriously about what it means to be white. How does race affect our life? What does it mean to be primarily existing in overwhelmingly white spaces? What does white supremacy, living in a white supremacist culture, do to us? And in asking those questions and doing, and doing that work, it helps us to get more easier, if you will, it takes a long time, but to talk about race. And as leaders, we have to learn how to talk about race and do it in a way that, as Claire pointed out, makes, it gets uncomfortable, but we can lead in ways that can invite people to be uncomfortable or to even make people uncomfortable and they don't leave the church. That's part of leadership. So we find ways to, uh, in all the unique contexts we are in, uh, to have authentic conversations about race so then we can get clearer on the work that needs to be done to bring about a more equitably racial, rec racially equitable culture, country. We need to learn that racism has been defined in ways that allow us as progressives to feel like we're not part of it. And as Aaron beautifully pointed out, we need to be able to say authentically, we are racist. We live in a racist country. I am a racist. It means unlearning our history, relearning our history, recognizing this country is not what so many of us were taught it was. And that is hard. And we know that there are many different, uh, many of you have done lots of anti-racism work already. And so part of what we're gonna uh, kind of propose or, or, or move forward is uh, a platform in which there are multiple entry points, different ways in which you can engage. If this is a totally new conversation for you or you have never done anything, there's places to start there. If there's a place you've done a little bit, maybe read something that's picked your interest and you want to, you're a little more comfortable, there's, there's a place to start there. If you've been doing this work for a long time and you're ready to, uh, to do another, uh, uh, to do even more, even deeper work, uh, there'll be avenues there. Uh, Larry, I thought I saw posted in the chat, the sacred conversations to end racism is an amazing tool, but we know that's not available for everybody or, or may not be able to do it, although it would be great if every church uh, could, could be a part of that. So Aaron, I don't know if you were going to, well, anyway, that'll be a, that'll, I'll, that'll be a, a round to, to show you later, but, um, you know, th just a reminder that, you know, this is not, um, a one and done thing. I think it's even bigger than a movement. This is just something that changes the church altogether and it changes how we orient, how we are church. Uh, you know, it, it's going to mean, it's going to disrupt the system. It's going to make us uncomfortable. You know, if it, it means even changing things, as Aaron said, you know, if we're going to, in, in the future, if we hire people, if we have a board of directors, do we say that everybody has to have anti-racism training before they get to lead? I think these are important questions to ask and to, to think about how we want to uh, engage in the future and how we want to have who our leaders want to, who we want our leaders to be. 
and this isn't going to be done just by this task force. If there's others that want to um, to help lead in, in various ways, um, you know, that there'll, there'll be spaces for that as well. I don't know if Thanks, Logan wanted to. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to cut you off. Were you finished? No, you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I also saw Logan on here. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I wasn't sure. Um, also, we have a member of our think tank, Tundiway. Dale Ferguson is the pastor in Loveland, and she is on vacation this week. Um, but she, is also, she has also been an a instrumental part of this group. I do want to share um, just a, a sample of what we are starting as to what Chris was speaking of and what we are hoping to build together. So I'm gonna share my screen briefly. Uh, this is not by any means comprehensive. This is, this is a beginning place of what we are, what we are um, envisioning. And many of you I know have already filled out the survey. I sent that out yesterday. Uh, we'll be continuing to collect those responses, but part of what we wanna do and part of what the, the vision of the conference has been for the last five years is not that everything comes through the conference, but that there are cells and networks and circles of places where people can engage and there are leaders everywhere. And so um, if you are doing something in your church that others can join, we wanna, we wanna amplify that. We want people to know about it. We want people in the conference to be able to work together in places where they might not be able to do it in their context or in their local community. And so, um, I see Deborah's hand is raised. Let me share this, Deborah, and then I will come back. Or do you want to speak to this specifically? Why don't you go ahead, uh, Deb? And don't forget to unmute yourself. Still, still can't hear you. There we go. No, continue on. Um, uh, because what I have to say is rather lengthy, but uh, so I want you to finish your thought okay. uh, because it's, it's very important. Okay, thanks, Deb. So uh, let me just see here, make sure I don't have to scroll through a zillion things for you to have to see. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Are you all seeing? Uh, see if I can shrink this a little bit. Um, how do I get rid of all of that? Well, I will scroll here a little bit. Um, so sort of imagining um, this platform and beginning to develop, what are we, what's our vision? What are we, what are, why are we doing this? And what is our, what is our driving vision and mission here at, as a team for racial justice in the Rocky Mountain Conference. And our vision is to foster and sustain anti-racist beloved community. Proposed mission to educate, support, and mobilize individuals and congregations to become anti-racist and engage in anti-racist action as an expression of deliberative Christian faith and practice. So we played with a little bit of a metaphor of toe dippers, waders, and swimmers, just as a way of um, Imagining where we where being able to identify where we are in this in this work and in this conversation. And so we're going to be identifying places to begin for churches to engage in conversation for individuals. We will have um, books and much of this work has already been developed by many people. We just want to make it accessible on our website and as a central place for people in our conference to come and participate. We will also what we want to do is have a real time ongoing places where people can participate. So Loveland is having a Dismantling Racism 101. We are all digital. We are all online at this point. So people can come and participate um, from all across the conference. So uh, Jane Bernard is offering something this, this fall on Saturdays, um, uh, Racism Through the Lens of White Privilege and a Spiritual Quest webinar uh, through the Spiritual Direction Colorado. So we're wanting to put all of our, um, all of the different opportunities that we are aware of and continue to be aware of and, and put them in front of you as one way for us to continue this work together. And places that are a little bit more involved or, or longer commitments or deeper work. Um, several in our conference have taken the soul to soul training in Denver. That class begins August 8th. So this is gonna be available 
for you to come and see, for you to come and add, so we can continue. This is a beginning place. I think this will continue to evolve as we take steps together, as we work together. Uh, this will continue to change and, and shift and merge. Um, there is an action happening through the truth and truth and conciliation uh, that Claire has brought to our attention. It is a walk, walk the walk faith pilgrimage, and that is information will be about that. So. These things will continue to change. They will continue to, um, new things will continue to be added. Uh, so that's one, that's one picture we are, or one, one way we want to move forward with um, wherever you are, find a place. Wherever you are, take a next step. Wherever you are, as a congregation, as an individual, there is a way forward. There is a step forward. And, um, and so we wanna make that available. We want to make that a conference-wide commitment. So there is that, that platform that we've shared. And we also then are asking for people who want to help develop each of those, each of those buckets, so to speak, and, and really be part of the pace setter, be part of the racial justice team that ensures this continues, ensures that sustainability works to collect the things that are happening, works to um, resource the conference, all of us together. So uh, we're asking for those of you who want to be part of the, the um, development of each of these buckets, so to speak, each of these paths, uh, we're gonna be sending out more information about a, a next conversation that will be smaller for each one of those uh, buckets. And, um, and continue to carry this conversation forward together. I don't know if anyone from the team wants to add to that platform um, piece. I'm seeing lots of things. We will save the chat uh, that we can add. Uh, so thank you for putting those resources in there. Um, Aaron, I, I will- Please, Logan, that'd be great. Speak great. really quickly to kind of that chart and um, my experience in general is that sometimes, and not just with racism and white supremacy, but any big and important issue that requires our work, it can feel so big and so daunting that we're afraid to enter into it. Um, and I have felt that way multiple times. I feel like on that chart, I don't know if you saw that there were kind of the way, one way that we described those three different levels was toe dippers, waders, and swimmers. People who are, you know, kind of dipping in their toe, people who have entered it a little more fully, and people who are, are swimming in it or submerged in it or actively, you know, fully participating in um, anti-racist action. And I think that, um, and Chris alluded to this, like you can be at different places at different times in your life too. I think there have been times where I was a swimmer and now, and then I go back to being a waiter or something along those lines. But at any rate, it can feel so daunting. But something that I learned, um, and I think it's been so helpful to me that it's worth sharing is that we are going to mess up. Like there, this is a process that is, it's difficult, it's big. And if we're afraid we're gonna mess up, then we'll never enter it. Um, so whatever place you're at, you can take a step further in. And maybe that you might experience um, putting your foot in your mouth or saying the wrong thing or showing your white privilege a little too much. Um, but if you don't enter into it, you'll never learn that. And so there's no way to avoid um, slip ups that will happen in pursuit of this important goal, this learning and, and growing. Um, so for what it's worth, I just wanted to put that in there. I have put my foot in my mouth many times. I have fallen back on my white privilege and, and I mess up and um, I think we, we can't use it as an excuse not to enter into the work. One thing too I'd like to um, contribute to it as well is that if there was any ever a time to rely on the spirit of resurrection, 
um, it would be now. When I was uh, coming into the United Church of Christ from a different denomination, and I was on an interview, and they asked me what was one question that I had um, for the church. And I said, uh, the question that came to me in that moment was, if we believe in resurrection, why is the church so afraid to, of dying? And they asked me what I mean by it. And I was like, there's, there are things that we need to die to. And if we don't die to those things first, the spirit of resurrection will never be able to be activated in us. And the teachings that we uh, profess tell us this. Uh, and it's, I believe personally that we have to choose uh, this death, but if we choose this death, then the spirit of Christ is alive in us. And that one of the things that I believe adds to all of this is the fear of death, that all of this is built on the fear of death, is fear on the fear of loss, of what, what will I have to lose? Um, but Paul taught, and I think that he was inspired to, I mean, you can say what you want to say about Paul. There's a lot of contention about Paul, um, but there's some wisdom in there. And part of it is that the, um, there will be something revealed in us and the struggles of this time are nothing compared to that. But if we don't get into the struggle, we're never gonna see what can be revealed in us. And so I would invite us to remember that and to move boldly knowing that the, the leader of our faith, as we say, um, died and came back. <laughs> so if, if, if we believe that in any capacity, whether it's metaphorically, whether it's literally, whatever it is, there's something that can die and be reborn. And whatever is reborn will be so much more uh, beautiful and inviting than, than holding on to these, uh, these bones. So mm -hmm. I'd like to add that. Thanks, Pedro. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna get, I, I, um, so glad we recorded this. <laughs> um, Deborah, I will come back to you. I know, thank you for waiting patiently here. It's okay. Uh, did you want me to speak now? <laughs> just Sarah, as a, um, yes. let me just, let me also just say um, we do have a meeting at uh, another a AC thing happening uh, at five thirty. So we need to end this one before five thirty so that we can switch Zoom meetings. It's on the same, same account. But I just I'm just letting you know before we it's about five. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I am so fortunate to be with a group of loving, caring, and honorable people. Uh, I can't say enough about that. Um, the next thing that I have to say is this. I, I see something more sinister um, with with regards to to racial justice, and um, in in the sense that this is just part of what's happening uh, today and what's dividing our attention. Although it's truly important, um, I my grandson has been or was in fact marching. <laughs> Bless his heart. He graduated from high school a year ago and. He decided he would march every day for racial justice in, in Denver, downtown. Um, and so I am so proud of him, although my daughter was really, really concerned, but she understood that um, he was beyond her right now. He was coming into his own. He was making choices. Uh, and I thought that they were good choices in terms of his life. The second thing that I want to say is um, with regards to, to racial justice, it's, um, it's insidious and, and it can be applied not only um, uh, uh, in, in terms of color, but, but according to Mother Teresa, it had to do with disease as well. So I, I certainly want to cover some bases here, and I'm going to do so lightly. Um, someone mentioned um, Strange Fruits, which reminded me of Billie Holiday. Um, and what she was talking about truly was the hanging tree. And, uh, and we've been there. 
And what makes me particularly sad is that we have been to these places and we haven't learned uh, collectively. Um, we haven't learned that, that we sink or swim together um, and, and we have to come together because there are really some important work that we have to do. Um, the thing that I wanted to mention is uh, I attended Sunday, one of the churches that, um, or at the church that, where I was baptized in, in the, the early 80s. And um, the minister, came to the pulpit and he said, you know, I never ever talk about this uh, from the pulpit. Uh, I never intended to talk about this from the pulpit, but I have to say something. And what he was talking about, as he saw it, was an attack on the churches. And the attack on the churches had to do with um, the example that, that particularly incensed him was what happened in Nevada, uh, where apparently uh, uh, a, a law was upheld. Um, churches can only have 50 people, you know, uh, to come in and, and worship in, in church, while the casinos are able to have 50% of their, their uh, typical attendance um, to go in and, and gamble. And so certainly we see an incursion in, in the separation of, um, of church and state. So all of this is coming together, certainly in a, in a perfect storm. And I frankly am, un, you know, uncertain as to how we can look at all these things together. We have to, because we all have certainly a, a battle coming up and i understand truly i understand that COVID 19 is is very dangerous to all of us and i can't help but feel that um if it wasn't kobe 19 it would be something else and um so we we it's kind of hard to make your voices heard um when you're closeted it's it's uh, hence the importance of these young people getting together and marching for for social justice in the midst of this. There's a there's a whole lot of ways to look at what's going on today, and I simply ask that that we examine it in its totality, uh, because I I see um, just so many things that will diminish us. Um, as I said, because we are church, regardless of denomination, and, and I, for one, am a marcher, and I've been out there <laughs> marching for a lot of causes that I thought was important, and um, and uh, certainly not not recently, but I've been doing other things that that I think are essential, and so um, which is working at at food banks, and so. I, I guess I, I want to come full circle with this entire conversation. And I and I, I I want to point out that it isn't just about social justice. It's really about everything right now. And the question is, do we tackle one thing at a time or um or how we would want to 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 handle it to to talk about it to to share to um to make sure that others understand that rights across the board um are being affected and we have to acknowledge that and have to figure out where we are in all of that and that's all I have to say. Thank you for being so polite and, and <laughs> listening to me. And I'm not sure that I shared it as well as um, I should have or could have, but I just wanted to put it out there. So appreciate you doing so, Deb. It is, it is all intersected. It isn't, there is no separation. I, I you know, so appreciated uh, your bringing that, bringing that here and recognizing that and, um, 
and it, it reminds me of Susan Thistlethwaite's uh, keynote of of it as well. Just there, we can't separate out, separate out these issues. Um, I'm recognizing we have about five ish minutes. Um, I, I know the chat box is full at this point. We don't have time for questions, but I would invite you if you do have a question for the future or if you want to make sure something is recorded to put it in the chat box and our team can look at that um, as far as uh, where's where where we um, What you want to continue to see how you want to participate. I'm going to turn it. I see Claire and then I'm going to turn it to Anthony. Aaron, we, we had had a conversation, although we um, had certainly more to talk about tonight, about um, putting together another opportunity to gather in such a way um, in the future with an opportunity to possibly to break into groups at that point. Um, we just hadn't set up a time or a date for that, but that was something that, that certainly our group was tossing around. Yes, that, that was the, yep, the, the reference. Um, we are going to be following up with another another kind of call uh, that would break up into some smaller groups. And you're right, we do not have the date, but we will be getting that out. Um, and thanks, Claire, for just um, acknowledging the beginning, this is beginning, the beginning conversation together. Um, Anthony, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, in a portion of the time to, that we have left together, I want to bring you back to to Moses and this burning bush. The Reverend Tracy Blackman in a, in a sermon talked about uh, there being burning bushes all around us, which calls us to turn aside, or call us to turn aside. We're so glad that you have turned aside for this moment and come into this space, this strange space with a, with a strange fire. Uh, we are glad that you have come and taking off your shoes, not just by, by muting your, your mics, but by listening intently to what has been said. I'm also mindful that God did not send Moses from that place uh, empty-handed. God did not send Moses from that place uh, without assignment. God said, uh, Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you. I will be with you. On this journey, God is with you. It, it, it is a um, treacherous journey at times, yes. It is a journey uh, that, that causes us to, to lose friends, maybe even gain some enemies. And so this think tank was called together by Sue to, to walk with you in this journey. We have already thought and strategized about resources that we can offer for you and for your congregations to engage in. We have qualified them under the, the headings toe dippers, waders, and swimmers. Those are uh, resources everywhere from books to engage on the individual level or to studies to engage in uh, as a corporate level with the congregation or perhaps with, a, with persons uh, in a national setting. So we want you to feel free uh, to contact Aaron, to contact Sue for more information for that list that we are uh, constantly uh, perfecting. You have been called to turn aside. You have taken a moment to turn aside, taken off your shoes and listened uh, to this wisdom, to this holy wisdom, to this holy word. And now we call you to go back out, uh, changed with the mission and with purpose. Uh, and, and we want to walk with you uh, to help you to be as equipped as you can be uh, for this arduous journey uh, to, to confront this Pharaoh, this, this ruling uh, uh, system called racism and white supremacy. I invite you, I invite you all to take a deep cleansing breath. Receive this blessing. And now 
May the Lord torment you. May the Lord keep before you the faces of the hungry, the lonely, the rejected, and the despised. May the Lord afflict you with pain for the hurt, the wounded, the oppressed, the abused, the victims of violence. May God grace you with agony, a burning thirst for righteousness. May the Lord give you courage and strength and compassion to make ours a better world, to make your community a better community, to make your church a better church. May you do your best to, be, to make it so. And after you have done your best, after you have done your best to speak truth to power, after you have done your best to witness and to deconstruct white supremacy within yourself and within the, the realms you inhabit, then, and only then, may the Lord grant you peace. Go in peace and may the peace of God go with you.